After more than six weeks, 20,000 tips, and what will be a second cross-country trip, the suspect in the Idaho College murders will soon be back in Moscow. And it is likely because of evidence that is too small for the naked eye to see. The reports say that Moscow police have matched Brian Koberger's DNA to some DNA evidence that was found at the crime scene. And that, my friends, is impressive for two reasons. Let me tell you why. The crime scene was a well-known party house visited by hundreds of kids and tenants over the years. So how on earth they isolated just one man's DNA from all the other sources in that house? Well, that in itself is remarkable. And then there's this. Koberger doesn't have a criminal record. So it is highly unlikely that his DNA was in any criminal database. So how did they track one person's DNA at the crime scene all the way to Koberger, 2,500 miles away? It turns out it's a multi-step process and it is fascinating. I'm joined by Joseph Scott Morgan. He is a certified death investigator and forensic analyst. He's also the distinguished scholar of applied forensics at Jacksonville State University. Okay, Joe, this is your backyard. How do they determine that one foreign source of DNA at the crime scene actually belongs to a killer as opposed to all the other people who've come in and out of that house uh, invited and, and party guests and former tenants? Well, we have to think about those that are currently domiciled in the home and you begin to eliminate them. Certainly these poor victims, uh, they, they have DNA samples from them that would have been taken at autopsy. And then you have the two that were spared down the lower section. They would have done buccal mucosal swabs or cheek, uh, cheek scrapings on them and eliminated them. And then any of these parties that would have had intimate relationships uh, where you would have rich source DNA semen, blood, that sort of thing, you would have gone out if, if they were given those names and collected those samples. Now, all the other DNA that you're talking about that's in this environment was probably touch DNA. And that's only fragmented DNA that you have. It's not a, a full partial, uh, it's not a full strand, it's only a partial strand. That comes from the sloughing of dead skin cells. So then after you have all of that, you eliminate everybody that's known, and then if you come up with one person, that's who well, you have that, to go Joe, after. Forget it. That to me would have taken years because oh, hundreds no. and hundreds of kids have come in and out of that house. I thought you were going to say, honestly, that yeah. the skin that was under the fingernails of the victims, that's not have, a party goer, or the blood from the killer who accidentally right. got cut and shed his own wet blood. Well, no party goer would have shed wet blood that night, or maybe no. a hair that was on top of a pool of blood. Well, that would have right. to come from someone who was there after. So yeah. that's what I thought they probably collected, as opposed to just some DNA that was found in the house. No, 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 no. Uh, let me be very clear. When we say blood in the house, okay, if he did in fact cut himself, and we're assuming that this sample comes from blood, there are other means that you can get rich DNA, semen, saliva, even sweat, Ashley. But in this case, I think that the fingernails are going to, you remember you aired one of the first, the first pieces about this nationally relative to bagging the hands. We're back to that now. It, not just skin are you going to have beneath the fingernails. You kind of have blood as well. And there might be hair full full hair you know where you have a follicle and you have a root and you can dig into that that's what's so fascinating about this and then after that piece after that piece that's when uh genetic uh genealogy comes in well that's piece two and that's fascinating but i am so interested in your science especially when i think of the 40 40 fingernails that had to be scraped because there were yes. four victims with 10 fingers each, 10 fingernails. And what also was fascinating is which one of those victims might have had, might have had some fingernail scrapings because that's going to be something that the defendant is going to want to know and may not know for a long time because, of course, he could fashion a defense as to why his fingernail scrapings might be under a, a girl, but how could he? fashion a defense as to why they'd be under three or four people. Um, Joe, I have to leave it there, but I'm going to have you back because this conversation Please is sit. a lot longer. So I always love what you have to say. Joseph Scott Morgan uh, joining us tonight. Okay, so that was step one, isolating the suspect's DNA from the crime scene. Right, that's the first part. But step two is identifying who the mystery DNA belongs to. 
A few years ago, if the killer wasn't already like a criminal with his DNA sitting in the criminal system, right? Well, investigators would have a really tough time finding him, right? Like the Golden State Killer. They couldn't find that guy for decades because he was a cop. He wasn't a criminal with a bunch of DNA sitting in a criminal system somewhere. But today, companies like 23andMe and Ancestry.com, they've got all of us, like criminals and non-criminals alike, we're all spitting into a tube and mailing it off to these companies voluntarily. We're sending in our DNA. So all cops have to do these days is call up those databases and submit the killer's DNA sample. And then voila, up comes an entire family tree. And likely that killer is somewhere in that family tree. Problem is you gotta figure out which member of the family tree is the killer. And for that part of the process, I wanna bring in Cece Moore. She is an investigative genealogist. She's known as the DNA detective. She's helped identify more than 200 violent criminals. So Cece, this is tricky and it's fascinating, but you've got this massive family tree, maybe 30 or 50 or 100 members of a family. Where do you start? How do you weed out which members of the family are innocent and which one is the one that matches what they found at the crime scene? Well, taking a step back, it's not quite as simple as you just laid it out because Ancestry DNA and 23andMe, which are the largest databases by far, actually bar law enforcement from using them. And so we are limited in this work to the two smallest genetic genealogy databases, which are GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA. And so we can only compare against a total of about 2 million genetic profiles. If somebody's DNA is being used for these cases, they have consented to that. In GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA, they have been notified that law enforcement is using the databases and they have opted in or not opted out in one case. So there, the, the opting part, that's the fascinating part because I know that early on in the 23andMe and Ancestry, it was kind of open season until they freaked out and thought, oh gosh, don't get our company involved in this. And then it became an option for us, the customer, to say, yeah, I'm fine. You can pop my DNA into any database or no, you may not. Don't we have that option? No. Ancestry DNA and 23andMe will not allow law enforcement to use their database, and it has never been used for investigative genetic genealogy, to my knowledge. And I'm pretty dialed in. I think I would know. I actually approached them back in 2011 and 12 and asked them if they were willing to work with crime scene DNA. They made it very clear from the very beginning they would never be involved with this. And they have deep pockets and big legal teams, and they will fight any effort of law enforcement to get into their databases. And so it's the two small companies only that give you that option to opt in. Now, if you've tested at one of the big companies like Ancestry, you can download your raw genetic data file and upload it to GEDmatch and opt into law enforcement. Okay. So tell me this, once, yeah. once they get a family tree, what's next? You got, you know, people all over the world potentially you know with the last name smith how do you determine between all the smiths who the person is you need well you don't get a family tree what happens is you get a lift list of matches and that's people that are sharing small amounts of dna with that unknown suspect if you get lucky maybe you'll get a first cousin and then you're in business because you only have to go back to grandparents to find that common ancestor but most of the time we're using second third fourth fifth cousins and beyond so we have to build trees for a dozen or two dozen three dozen people and try to find the patterns and the commonalities identify the common common ancestors in their trees. And from that, we can reverse engineer this unknown suspect's family tree. And so there's a okay. lot of work. That yeah, and I was going to say a lot of gumshoe after that, right? So don't you look at like, well, cousin, you know, Ethel is only, you know, she's 90, so she didn't commit this crime. And cousin Eric is in jail, so he's got an alibi. And, you know, cousin Mike is nine, so he didn't commit this. Is that literally what you do until you get a group of potential suspects who could have committed this, then you got to actually gumshoe and follow them and get their DNA to, to match against the, the source DNA. It depends how much you have to work with in that database. And part of that is luck. Have any of his closer relatives tested and uploaded there and opted in? Or if you only are working with very distant cousins, then you have a lot more you need to look at. But if you're fortunate enough to be able to find a connection on his mom's side and his dad's side, 
then that would point just at his one family and only him since he's the only son as far as I understand. Now, if you don't have the, that match data and you only have, say, one second cousin that is a really good match, then you have to go back to great grandparents. And yes, they might have 20 great grandsons. And at that case, is, that's where you start looking at who is the right gender, who is in the right age range, who might have lived near the crime scene, and then who drove a white Elantra. And so we don't really know how much they had, but it is possible that the genetic genealogy pointed straight at him and they only had it's to look just, at him. Just remarkable science and you're perfect for explaining it. Cece Moore, thank you so much for being on tonight. Really appreciate it.